The evening was finally cooling off in Briar Green. Professor Tian Das walked along the familiar, beautifully landscaped sidewalk to meet his nephew, Leo the Card, as he called himself, at a local coffee shop. He has hopes that he will be able to convince his nephew to veer away from wanting to be a magician, he frowned. Glancing upwards, he finds inspiration in seeing the tall slender towers of the university where he teaches. Then his eyes are drawn downwards towards two people across the street. A young lady was negotiating with a slightly older gent gentleman who was obviously drunk. His appearance was that of affluence, but he had obviously fought in the wars. She seemed very annoyed with his behavior. Mr. Cromwell, Sir Rufus Cromwell, it is me, Dr. Charlotte Winters. She paused, waiting to see if he recognized her. Rufus, Rufus, stop falling over. Charlotte's eyes glanced past him for just a moment. She noticed a lady with a bowler hat that had a note card slid into its band that said press. Great, Charlotte sighed. Just what Sir Cromwell needs. Rufus, Charlotte returned her attention back to the man. Can you go over to the coffee shop? I will be right over there. Sir Cromwell's head slid sideways, enough to see the coffee sign on the building. Coffee, good. He began to stumble his way across the street. Professor Tian Das took this as, a, as his opportunity to hurry up inside to order before the veteran made his way over and caused a commotion. Charlotte looked directly at the press lady, who continued to stare back at her. Charlotte, not appreciating the invasion of privacy, walked directly towards her. As Sir Cromwell made his awkward path across the street, another young man in a glittering silver and gray tails jacket strutted his way down the sidewalk. With his head in the clouds and a skip in his step, he did not notice the stumbling Sir Cromwell trip on the curb. Sir Cromwell fell tragically into the young man's arms. Momentarily surprised, he stepped back, allowing Sir Cromwell to fall to his knees. Oh dear, the young man exclaimed. He quickly reached down to help the fallen hero up but found himself nearly too weak to assist. With great effort, they lifted each other up and stood precariously. The young man could not but help notice the incredible orange flaming hair on top of the drunken man. Dear sir, may I get you some coffee? Sir Cromwell pointed completely in the wrong direction, then said, Coffee. Yes, yes, coffee. Come this way. I will help you. They entered the coffee shop and looked briefly around. The young man spotted his uncle and waved jubilantly. Uncle Tion! His uncle looked up and frowned for just a moment before correcting his demeanor. He then raised his hand in salutations and beckoned his nephew over, while watching the gentleman that was slouched into a chair. Once Sir Cromwell was safely placed into the chair, he immediately lowered his head onto the table. The young man, Leo the Card, waved at a waitress and mimed for a coffee drink for the slumped fellow and signaled that he would pay for it. She nodded and smiled. Uncle! Leo waved again as he made his way over. 
Back with Dr. Charlotte Winters. She marched up to the press agent and inquired, Can I help you? The lady stared back at her. Her mind was racing. What had she just seen? She looked intently at Charlotte. Can she be trusted? Worry and concern weighed heavily. She looked up and said, I am Jacqueline O'Lantern, she paused. I just saw something unbelievable. I, I don't know what to do. Everything's okay, you're safe. What did you see? Jacqueline looked around, hesitating to speak. Charlotte placed her hand on Jacqueline's shoulder. Why don't you go over to the coffee house across the street? You will see a man with fiery orange hair. Sit with him. He's a little drunk, but if you are in trouble, he will protect you. Trust me. Charlotte's last words trailed off as she moved Jacqueline towards the coffee shop. Did that plant just die? Go on, dear. Charlotte insisted that Jacqueline move on to the coffee shop. I will be right there. Charlotte stepped around Jacqueline and went to look at the plant. What a weird day, she mumbled. She looked back once, making sure Jacqueline was on her way. Then she made her way to the dying plant. As she approached, the smell was horrible, almost noxious. She stopped in front of the bush and right before her eyes the plant turned brown and withered. Oddness. Then a blurry blue and green swirl began to appear at her feet. What is this? As she tried to focus on the strange whirlpool of color everything grew dark and she passed out. By the time Jacqueline had crossed the street, she looked back to see if Charlotte was following. She was not. Her eyes moved over to where Charlotte now stood. Oh no! Not again! Not knowing what to do, she quickly ran into the coffee shop and looked for the man with the orange hair. Both Leo and Tion looked up at the frantic lady. She spotted the man with the bright orange hair and ran to him. Sir, sir, the lady, the lady I think you were meeting. Jacqueline paused, breathing heavily. Something just happened to her. How someone could go from stumble down drunk to instant battle readiness was beyond imagination. Sir Cromwell rose into a martial crouch stance and demanded, where? Jacqueline spun around and pointed out of the coffee shop and down the street. Without hesitation, Sir Cromwell sprinted down the street immediately spotting where Charlotte was. Leo, Tion, and Jacqueline curiously followed. As Sir Cromwell came within 10 feet, he saw the swirling vortex but also spotted a bizarre blue glow glowing creature. Its skin was foul, covered with pus oozing warts. The creature's body was round and inefficient. Without a second thought, Cromwell attacked the creature with a powerful sidekick. He struck the beast hard. It shimmered violently, then dissolved into the air. Sir Cromwell was momentarily confused on what the creature was. Then looking down, he noticed that he was standing in the blue-green swirling mist, just as he blacked out. Leo, Tion, and Jacqueline arrived to the scene. Tion stepped forward and surveyed. The swirl was getting larger. He stepped back. What is this? He studied it. Leon asked, did that weird blue creature do this? 
don't think so, replied his uncle. A vortex like this has to be created by someone somewhere else. Jacqueline asked as she stepped forward, can we pull him out? The professor raised his hand to stop her forward motion, then pointed downward. Watch out. Don't step forward. The circle was growing and she almost got snared. Leo stepped next to his uncle. I know you think my magic is nonsense, but check this out. I will do a search teleport ability I learned just the other day to find the people doing this. His uncle, Professor Tian Das, looked at his nephew with alarm and tried to stop him. Leo, the card, did a fancy motion and suddenly disappeared, only to reappear instantly, stuck in the vortex. Leo looked at his uncle almost comically as he too went unconscious. We need to find help, exclaimed Tian. Then he looked at Jacqueline. She was staring west. The little round creature came from that direction, she pointed. I can see its path of dead plants. Tian and Jacqueline took off at a run. Their path took them westward, slightly edging towards the glass sea. They came to the end of Briar Green, where it was lush and green. They stopped when they saw where they were going. Westrek. Westrek was a savage area. It was war-torn, poverty-stricken. It was very dangerous place to even walk in. Landmines still occasionally get discovered the hard way. Not good. They continued forward. As they went into the war-torn city, they found there were people. They spotted a group of five people all speaking to an individual with an interesting hat. Tion and Jacqueline joined the group. The person in the hat looked over at them. Hey, if you want to join the group, you'll, it'll cost you a silver each. Tion spoke. Uh, please, sir, uh, do you know anything about people disappearing into a blue-green vortex? The guide looked at them with anger. Lies! Do you see, folks, what we have to put up with? How can we get businesses back into this area if people keep saying nonsense like that? Tion tried to interrupt, but, 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 the guide suddenly whistled and gestured for some official people to come over. Four surly men sauntered over, dressed in periphery clothing. What do you got, Joe? These two troublemakers are spreading lies about West Eklund. The guide thumbed at Tion and Jacqueline. All right. You two are with us. Tian and Jacqueline grudgingly followed, trying to explain what happened. One of the officers leaned in to Tian. It's okay. Talk quietly. My name is Malaika Das. I'm here to help. They began to explain. Meanwhile, Charlotte, Sir Cromwell, and Leo were sucked through the vortex. As they slowly became conscious, they realized they were in pain. Then they heard other people moaning and screaming. It was pitch black. There seemed to be things squirming and moving above them and below them. The things moving were warm and wet, slippery. The weight on them was massive and crushing they could barely move. Charlotte tried to wriggle a flashlight from her sack while Sir Cromwell went for his gun. Something large shifted on top of Sir Cromwell. He wanted to start shooting. Just then, Charlotte's light came on. Sir Cromwell stopped just in time. These weren't strange creatures. These were other human bodies, all stacked, heaped, and piled upon each other. Other vortex must 
have opened all over Briar Green and they were transported here. There must have been a hundred bodies all piled on top of each other. The ones at the bottom were screaming in horror. Sir Cromwell grabbed Leo and called to Charlotte. Let's get out of here. With a massive force, Sir Cromwell started shoving and pushing his way through the mountain of humans while Leo and Charlotte followed close behind. Not thinking of any other, Cromwell stepped and drove his way to the top. As he came to the peak, he saw a similar glowing whirlpool two feet above him. Without a second thought, he leapt up reached for the edge and then pulled himself through the swirling glow. Charlotte and Leo saw him disappear. What happened? Then they saw his arm reaching back down and one by one he started pulling the others out. Charlotte and Leo came out into a dark cavern. Charlotte suddenly began to feel a terrible sense of dread. While Leo and Sir Cromwell continued to assist others out of the hell hole, Charlotte began to look around. She couldn't help but think there something was out there. Quick, out of the corner of her eye. Did she see something? Rufus, I, I think there's something here with us. Sir Cromwell stopped immediately and surveyed the dark room listening intently. Nothing. There's nothing. He continued to help the others. Charlotte's flashlight crossed what appeared to be a corridor heading upward from the cavern. There's a corridor! We need to get out of here! She turned to convince Leo, but Leo had disappeared. With everyone helping each other, they were able to get out about 30 people. But the others were too far down. They needed rope. They needed help. Sir Cromwell stood. All right, let's get out of here. We'll come back for the rest. Sir Cromwell looked over at Charlotte. She was not looking good, almost frantic. She was bordering hysterical. She ran ahead with her flashlight. Others began to follow. The crowd was chaotic and confused. She knew something was coming, something dangerous, something horrifying. She drew her father's old revolver. Nobody would listen. Nobody was hearing her. She shot her gun into the ceiling. The bullet ricocheted and then everyone heard someone get hit with the bullet and collapse. Sir Cromwell drew his gun. Drop it, he shouted. No, you're not listening to me. There's something here. There's something coming. Cromwell narrowed his eyes. Drop it. Don't test me, he said in a cold voice. Charlotte set the revolver on the ground. A couple of survivors reached to pick it up. Charlotte finally said, don't touch it. As they reached for it, she raised her hand to strike them. But Sir Cromwell reacted like a cat and tackled her and restrained her. Then up the corridor, voices could be heard. Lots of voices. The group began to get scared. Charlotte was in a panic. As they approached, Everyone could hear them begin to shout, We found some! We got some survivors! The periphery swarmed the group and began placing blankets on them and escorting them from the cavern. Someone got shot, one of the peripheries shouted. Sir Cromwell said, Charlotte, you're a doctor. Help that person. Charlotte, realizing her oath and duty, forced her fears down and ran to aid her victim. She quickly flashed her credentials at the officers and they let her pass. As she knelt, she realized they 
were pretty bad. Adeptly, she pulled some basic surgical tools from her bag and quickly went to work. She was able to pull out the bullet. She packed the bleeding and wrapped the injury. She instructed the periphery that the patient will need hospital care immediately. The periphery brought a stretcher and carried the injured person from the cavern. As they did this, new fears began to overwhelm Charlotte. She shot someone, almost murdered someone. There are witnesses. Am I going to jail? I must flee. I must hide. I must run. Charlotte pushed her way past all the periphery that were now going down the tunnel to rescue the others in the pit. They carried many ropes, ladders, and stretchers. Charlotte began to run, but was then blocked by Professor Tian Das and Jacqueline. Have you seen my nephew? Is he with you? As if nothing was going on, a hand was placed on Tian's shoulder. Hey, uncle, I'm right here behind you. Tian jumped in surprise. What the? How did you? Tian turned and saw Leo looking at him with a look of casualness. Sir Cromwell came up and joined them. He looked haggard. He kept his eyes on Charlotte. He now had the revolver in his pocket. Professor Tian Das looked at him curiously. Everyone okay? inquired Tian. Charlotte shot someone, Cromwell replied stoically. Tian looked at her with alarm. As he surveyed Charlotte, the periphery were escorting another survivor past them. He was frantic, scared out of his mind. The periphery had to put his hands in restraints and his legs were bound so he couldn't run. Then Tian saw it, a shadow. Let's go into the light. Rufus, can you keep an eye on Charlotte? Make sure she stays close. When they came out of the darkness and into the light, things were very bright. Tian, Leo, Jacqueline, Charlotte, and Rufus could now see that it was actually one of the periphery officers that was struck with terror. The officers were confused. Professor Tian Das stepped forward. I know what this is, part of my research. I believe they're infected with Phobavor. He said this as though everyone would immediately understand. As he looked at their confused faces, shadow phenomenon that generate and feed on fears. The periphery said, we will need to take them into custody. Jacqueline shouted, Oh no, no one's taking anyone anywhere. Not happening. The two peripheries seized Jacqueline. Looks like there's a third. Jacqueline began to struggle violently. I'm not infected. Get your hands off me. What is your badge number? I want names. I know my rights. The periphery escorted the three of them into a field operation tent a short distance away. The officer, Maleka Das, quietly came up to Leo, Tian, and Rufus and gave them a side head nod, beckoning them to meet him further from the main site. They nonchalantly followed him up behind an old shattered building. Up ahead, there's a safe house. Nothing dangerous ever goes in there. Just, well, just don't freak out about anything you might see. You will know the building. It's the only one still standing. Your friends will rejoin you there soon. We have an occultist to help with these situations. Tion was about to reply that they all had just met, but Malaika Das walked away without another word. 
Leo, Tion, and Rufus searched the landscape and saw a single building in the distance. They made their way there. The door was slightly ajar. Tion looked at the other two, then slowly opened the door. The warehouse building was dark. They cautiously entered. The door closed quietly behind them. The three stood silently, waiting for their eyes to adjust to the darkness. In the next room, they could hear a sound of whimpering. There was also a horrible smell, oddly familiar. They moved forward. Then, from out of nowhere, a surly, gruff old man walked past them, holding a very unusual Scottish dirk. He looked back and brought his index finger to his lips, signaling him to be very quiet and not to move. They looked past the hooligan and could see a skeleton lying on an altar. Slowly creeping around the altar, there were three more of the creatures that they had seen earlier in the day that killed the plant. The thug crouched down, ready to spring into action. Now! He rushed into the room as the skeleton got up wielding a fancy cutlass. Within seconds, all three of the creatures were destroyed. They cheered for each other and exchanged slaps on the back. Then the skeleton held his hand up with two fingers sticking up. The thug crouched. He crouched low and held his Scottish dirk in front of him. From around the corner, Sir Cromwell spotted them first. Before the skeleton or thug could react, Rufus dashed over and with a flying kick destroyed the first creature. As Rufus landed, he followed with a mighty elbow slam that annihilated the second creature. The skeleton and the thug cheered and congratulated him. The five of them were now alone. Greetings, said the ruffian. I am guessing Meleka Das sent you this way. He is supposed to assist in covering up any of the phenomenon activity, but I'm guessing you've already seen too much. Cap here, he pointed at the skeleton, used to be part of an organization called Candela Obscura. Now he's too much a phenomena to be allowed to exist, so he stays here with me. But we can help you join Candela Obscura. You are in for a real adventure. Just then, Charlotte and Jacqueline entered the building. Their faces showed shock and horror as seeing a skeleton donning a custom handcrafted pirate jacket and pants. As it turned out, Charlotte was indeed infected by a phobivore, but Jacqueline was released once she got the full interview. Charlotte looked at Rufus. May I, uh, have my father's gun back? Rufus looked defiant, but he pulled the gun from his pocket. But before handing it to Charlotte, he emptied all the bullets into his hand. Then he gave her the gun. Charlotte looked annoyed, but she knew she had lots more bullets. Next episode, Meeting Candela Obscura.